Hello, friends. Welcome to Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook. Today we're picking up in our next uh, lesson on the subject of soteriology. And in today's lesson, we're going to talk about the love of God as it relates to our salvation. As usual, I will post a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to my study notes. They are available in PDF format. Now, today's lesson, we're going to talk about the love of God that saves, the love of God that saves. And we're currently looking at uh, biblical terminology related to soteriology. We're doing a series of lessons on biblical terminology. In today's lesson, we're going to talk about love. And we're going to look at uh, several Hebrew words. We're going to look at some Greek words. We're going to look at uh, kesed and ahav briefly. Uh, we'll look mainly at agapao, the Greek verb. Uh, and then we'll look at agape as well, the noun form. Uh, but we'll see different words and how they're used in various contexts. Now, when we talk about love, uh, first and foremost, we should understand that it is an intrinsic attribute of God, an intrinsic attribute of God that motivated him to reach into time and space and to offer salvation to lost sinners who have offended him. See, in our series of lessons, we've been coming back to the cross uh, because the cross is the place where we meet God. And this is on his terms, not our terms. You see, in past lessons, we've emphasized that God is holy and that he's absolutely righteous. And the only thing that he can do with sin is to condemn it. We can produce sin, and we are the offenders. We have the ones. We are the ones who have offended uh, this righteous and holy God, and we can produce sin, but we cannot deal with sin. And we can do some good works, but the problem is, is that our good works are tainted by our sin, and they can never, never measure up to the perfect righteousness of God. That's impossible. So we are really in a jam. We cannot save ourselves at all. And so God, because he loves us, uh, desires that we be saved uh, from our sin and from eternal separation from him in the lake of fire. And so God solved the problem. And this occurred 2,000 years ago, nearly 2,000 years ago, at a point in time and space in, uh, in real history in which the second member of the Trinity, God the Son, came into this world and took upon himself humanity. In theology, we call that the doctrine of the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union teaches that Jesus is undiminished deity combined together forever with perfect humanity. He is the theanthropic person. He is the God-man. And when he came into this world, he was conceived supernaturally in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And Luke chapter 1 makes this very clear. And Isaiah 7.14 prophesied this. And so Jesus was supernaturally conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and this uh, by means of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was without a biological father. Now, Joseph was his legal father, but not his biological father. And Mary had, uh, and Joseph had children after the birth of Jesus. But Jesus came into this world minus any taint of sin, and so he did not have a sin nature. And so when he came into this world, the issue for him then was, would he live his entire life free from sin? Would he not commit sin? Because we come into this world with a sinful proclivity, a sinful flesh, that, uh, that the propensity or the proclivity of that flesh is to operate independently and contrary, really, to the character and to the will of God. But Jesus was not born with that, so he was not born with a sinful nature. So he was conceived and born uh, as Adam was created, perfect. And then the issue was, would Jesus go his entire life and commit no sin? Well, mission accomplished. He went his entire life, and passages like 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, 1 Peter 2.22, and 1 John 3.5 all make it very clear that Jesus committed no sin. And so when he went to the cross, he went to the cross as a sinless, perfect person. Uh, there was no guilt in him at all. But he went willingly to the cross, and he came into this world to offer his life as an atoning sacrifice. 
uh, in order that we might be redeemed, in order that we might be purchased from the slave market of sin, that we might be liberated and brought into a relationship with God. And so Jesus went to the cross willingly, and he laid down his life. Uh, John 10, 18 makes this very clear, where Jesus said, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. And so Jesus was not murdered against his will. He willingly went to the cross. He allowed the trials to take place. And remember that there were six illegal trials, and they all occurred from midnight until about 6 a.m. in the morning, roughly. Three of them were civil, and three of them were religious. And the religious trials uh, all found him guilty, and this was based on trumped-up charges and uh, lies that were set against him. The civil trials found him innocent, uh, and yet due to weak leadership, uh, Pilate surrendered to the demands of the insane mob, and so he was complicit in that regard in that he handed Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. And again, Jesus willingly went along with this. He allowed this to happen. And so the mockings, the beatings, the scourging, the twisting of the crown of thorns into his head, into his scalp, uh, and then made to carry his cross to his place of execution, to the place of Golgotha, uh, also known as the Hill of the Skull. And there he was crucified about 9 a.m. in the morning. And he hung on the cross for three hours until noontime. At that time, uh, we're told in the scriptures that the sky grew dark. And it was during that time from noon until three, where God the Father took all the sins of humanity and placed them upon Christ, and there judged him in our place, the just for the unjust, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.18. And Jesus even said that this was his purpose. In Mark 10, 45, um, he said, The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, to give his life a ransom for many. And this as a substitutionary atoning sacrifice. And so again, Jesus comes to the cross willingly and lays down his life. And so the Father judges Christ in our place And remember that the Father sent and Christ went, that Christ was, again, willing to go and die as our substitute. And so he went to the cross and he bore our sin, and he did die. He he simply exhaled and did not inhale, and he gave up his spirit. And the last thing that he said in John 19.30 was, it is finished, from the Greek word uh, tetelestai, which means literally paid in full paid in full. And so our salvation was completed at the cross, where Jesus died in our place, where he died for our sins. He died for all of our sins. And the debt that we owed to God was paid in full there at the cross. Jesus paid it all. And so when we come to God, we come to God not with our works, not with any system of works or merit. That system uh, does not work with God. Uh, not when it comes to our salvation. And so we come on the principle of grace uh, and faith. And so Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved. Grace, us in the Greek, C-H-A-R-I-S, us. And so by grace, now grace is undeserved favor. You don't deserve it. It is unmerited, unmerited kindness. And so this is the kindness that God extends to us uh, who really deserve the opposite uh, if we look at the record of Scripture. And so when we think about uh, grace, this is God's expression towards us as sinners because we don't deserve his love. We don't deserve this uh, salvation that he offers to us. And it says again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, through faith. And faith does not save, Christ saves, but faith is merely the vehicle or the instrument by which we receive or we take possession of that salvation, and that occurs by one simple act, and that is faith alone in Christ alone. It is not Christ plus anything we do, Christ plus joining a church, Christ plus walking an aisle, Christ plus uh, baptism. It's not Christ plus anything, it is Christ alone, because man needs only Christ 
to be saved. No one else and nothing more. And so we are saved by grace uh, through faith. And Paul is very clear in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where he says, and that not of yourselves. And you might put in there parenthetically, 100%. That not of yourselves. It, that is the whole salvation package, is a gift from God. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And so at the moment of faith in Christ, according to Ephesians 10.43, we receive forgiveness of sins. So the benefits of the cross are available for everybody, uh, but they are only received. They They only benefit those who actually place their faith in Christ. And at the moment of faith in Christ, we receive forgiveness of sins. And so the, the benefits of the cross are then applied to us. And not only that, but we receive the gift of righteousness. We receive the gift of eternal life and many, many other blessings. It is, it is such a wonderful thing, uh, but it is, it is received by faith alone. But when we think about the cross, and I keep coming back to this, and so I've repeated this and I'll repeat it again. But when we come back to the cross, we should see two attributes primarily at work at the cross. We should see God's righteousness because it is a place of judgment, and we must see it that way. We must see it as a place of judgment. And so when we come to the cross, we see where God is in fact judging Christ uh, who died in our place. Again, a willing substitute. He willingly uh, died for us. So he goes to the cross and God judges him there and pours out his wrath his righteous wrath uh, against Christ there upon the cross, again, who willingly took our sins upon him. But we must also see the cross as a place of love. We must see the cross as a place of love. And I think of Romans 5, 8, where it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, not when we were sweet and lovely and wonderful and charming because we were not and are not and will not be, but we're sinners before a righteous and holy God. And, and so God demonstrates his own love toward us, Paul says in Romans 5, 8. He demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died in our place, the just for the unjust. And he died for me, and he died for you. He died for all humanity. And all it takes for one to receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life is to simply trust in Christ and to trust in Christ alone. Because again, man needs only Christ to be saved. No one else, nothing more, only Christ, because he paid it all. And so we look to Christ and we trust in him and we trust in him alone. So Again, when we think about the cross, we think of it as a place of love. So again, going back to the notes here, love is an intrinsic attribute of God that motivated him to reach into time and space and offer salvation to lost sinners who have offended him. And this was a voluntary act on the part of God. This was a voluntary act as he was in no way compelled to act. But he did act for our benefit, and this is most pronounced in the sending of his son to die for us. The sending of of his son into the world uh, to bear our sins upon the cross, again, is a tremendous display of his love for us. In Scripture, we think of John 3.16, a very, very uh, famous passage, perhaps one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. And it says, For God so loved the world. Now that's all of humanity. This is all of humanity. God loves everyone, and Christ died for everyone. That's called unlimited atonement, that he died for everybody. But he says here, for God so loved the world. And how was that love displayed? That he gave. He gave his only begotten son, his uniquely born son, is how we should probably understand that best, his uniquely born son, that he gave his only begotten son, notice that whoever, that's all humanity, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so not to perish means not to perish forever uh, in the lake of fire. So at the moment of faith in Christ, it says whoever believes in him, and that's it, it's just simply faith alone. It's very, very simple. And 
as I've mentioned in past lessons, adding anything to faith neutralizes it. It, it really renders it inoperative because it's not faith plus anything. It is, it is salvation is by grace alone. It is unmerited favor. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, and not faith plus works. It is through faith alone in Christ alone that saves. So whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now here, the Apostle John used the Greek verb agapao, which speaks of God's love for lost sinners. And his love was manifest toward us by sending his uniquely born son as an atoning sacrifice so that we might not spend eternity in the lake of fire. Instead, we might believe in his son and come to possess eternal life. And love here is universal, extending again to all of humanity. And it is gracious because the object is undeserving. Remember Romans 5.8 but God demonstrates his own love. He demonstrates his own love toward us, again, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is, to call us sinners is, is the divine estimation of who we are. And so it is, a gracious, it is gracious because, again, the object is undeserving. And it is giving. It is giving as God gave his precious son to die for us. Listen, the, the cost of our salvation was extremely precious. It cost God his son. It can't get any more precious than that. And so this is by, you know, people use the term cheap grace, and it's really unfortunate because when we talk about the cross, there's nothing cheap about the cross. And what God accomplished at the cross is the most precious thing for us who are lost sinners so God's love is, it is giving in the sense that God gave his precious son to die for us. It is simple, being received by faith alone in Christ alone. I bang this drum over and over and over and over and over because so many people think that they must do something. They must give up something. They must do something new in their life, that they must do something to be saved. Listen, works have a place. Works should follow salvation. I've made this very clear. Works should follow salvation, good works, but they are never the condition of it. Never the condition of it. Salvation, phase one, justification. And remember, salvation is broken into three tenses or three phases or three time zones, we might even call it. Phase one is our justification. That is a one and done event. That is a one-time act in which we just simply believe in Christ, and at that moment we are born again, given new spiritual life at the moment of faith in Christ. That brings us into phase two of our salvation, which is our sanctification. That is a lifelong process. That's tough. That uh, requires us to be obedient to the word disciples, to learn his word, to live his word, and to come into complete and total submission to him, and to strive in our walk with him. And, uh, and that's, that, that aspect of our salvation is very synergistic. Now, it starts with God. It starts with his giving us new life, his empowering us, his uh, rendering the uh, sinful flesh within us uh, as crippled such that we do not have to yield to it. And he also gives us direction. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the Spirit. We can walk in the Spirit. God has given us everything we need for a successful life as a Christian. And that's phase two. That's our walk with the Lord. That's our sanctification. Phase three is our glorification. That's when we leave this world. The sin nature is removed. We're given a new body, and we enter into the eternal state at that moment. But what I'm talking about here is that phase one aspect where we just simply trust in Christ. So it's very simple, being received by faith alone in Christ alone. In Acts 4.12, Peter says, And there is salvation in no one else, okay? For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, by which we must be saved. And so it is just simply in Christ alone, and again, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
Uh, salvation is the gift of God. It is a gift, and a gift by its very nature means that it's free uh, to the recipient. It very, can be very costly to the giver, but it is absolutely 100% free to the one who takes it. That's called grace. Grace, it's unmerited favor, it's undeserved kindness. Uh, so by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. It's a gift from God to us. Again, not as a result of works. Not as a result of works. Paul's very clear on this in verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, he's there he's talking about phase 1 salvation. Now, he goes into phase 2. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand so that we, we there being believers who have entered into phase two salvation, so that we would walk in them. And so God calls us then to a life of goodness, a life of righteousness, a life of holiness. That's what he calls us to, and that is the Christian life. That's tough, and that requires sacrifice of everything in your life, your possessions, your wealth, your time, your resources, everything about you comes under uh, comes under submission to God, comes into submission to God. So again, salvation is very simple, being received by faith alone in Christ alone. And it is salvific, saving those who accept God's Son as their Savior. Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God or children of God. How? Through faith in Christ Jesus. It is, it is just simply by faith alone in Christ alone. But uh, we should also understand that the verb agapao uh, and, and the way that I understand the word and the word that I'm going to assign, to, that I'm going to affix to it now, uh, to perhaps, to help, uh, perhaps to help you understand, is the word commitment, is the word commitment. Uh, because agapao, uh, in many passages, uh, carries the idea of commitment to something. Now, the commitment can be positive, it can be to God. Uh, it can be negative. People, in other words, sinners can have agapao love. And I say this only because when I was a little boy, when I was a young boy, 8, 9, 10, and so on, uh, when I came to faith in Christ, and I was in church, and I did hear some things, I did learn some things, although I turned away and became a rascal for many years, uh, I, I was taught that agapao and agape is God's love, that it's only God's love. And many years later, when I was doing postgraduate studies at, in classical literature and studying classical Greek at Texas Tech University, and then when I came down to uh, seminary uh, to get uh, several more years of Greek, I wound up with four years of Greek in all. But when I was studying Greek, I came to understand that the things that I had learned when I was younger were not correct. And so I appreciated the understanding because it did correct my understanding of the Word of God. And so that's what I want to get into here is to explain that the use of the word agapao can carry with it um, the idea of commitment to something that is evil. So when referring to people possessed with negative volition, agapao becomes a commitment to that which is evil. And notice I'm using the word commitment here. It becomes a commitment to that which is evil. John wrote in John 3.19, he said, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness. They love the darkness. And the word love there translates our Greek verb agapao. And they love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. So these were people who were committed to the darkness. And even though you have the perfect display of God's love here and righteousness and truth and grace, and I mean, it's fully on display here in, in, in the Son of God, and yet these people turn away from that. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and uh, they love the darkness. And in John 12, 43, uh, it says that John here wrote of weak believers. They were, in fact, believers. The previous verse makes that very clear. In verse 42, it says, Nevertheless, many of the, even of the rulers believed in him. And there is the use of our Greek uh, verb pistuo, to believe there. Many of the rulers believed in him. That's pistuo. And that means that they came to have eternal life. But it says in the very next verse, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. So even though they're saved, they're weak believers at this point. Now, what they need is to grow up. Uh, they need to learn the word, live the word, and advance to maturity. But they're weak believers. And it says here in verse 43, for they, that is the ones who had believed in him, 
loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And there it uses the Greek verb agapao again, for they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, in both these passages, agapao denotes a commitment to that which is selfish and sinful. This commitment to evil finds similar usage in the Septuagint. The Septuagint, sometimes you'll see that as LXX, and that's a, it just, it's the Roman numerals that stands for 70. And the idea was that there were 70 Hebrew scholars who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. And this was roughly about 250 B.C., circa. Circa is just a Latin word. It means about or approximately. But the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And the word agapao is used of Samson, who loved a prostitute. There it uses the Hebrew uh, verb ahav, uh, which is a common word, Hebrew word for love. Kesed is another one. It's a stronger of the two. But here it says that he loved a woman. Now, this would be Delilah. Uh, but in the Greek uh, translation of this, the translators chose the Greek verb agapao as a synonym for the Hebrew verb ahav here. So uh, the word is used of Samson, who loved a prostitute. It's used of Solomon, who loved the wives that turned his heart away uh, from the Lord. It is said that unbelievers in John 5, 42, uh, he, he says, and do not, he says, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. So it is said of unbelievers that they do not have the love of God within them. Now, their love commitment is to self-interest and sin, which is characteristic of the world's love. And Christians are told, even Christians in 1 John 2.15, because John is writing to believers in his epistle there, his letter. And in 1 John 2.15, he says, And do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And there John uses the Greek verb agapao. But this is to believers. Is it possible for a believer to love the world? to be committed to Satan's world system, to his philosophies and values? The answer is emphatically yes, it is possible. Otherwise, this whole uh, directive, this negative command, would be absolutely meaningless if it were not possible. So again, John says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world, which shows that born-again believers have the capacity to love that which is contrary to God. Now, God, being holy and righteous and good, cannot love anything contrary to his nature. And because uh, God is immutable, and Malachi 3.6 tells us, God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. Now, this is talking about his essential attributes, his nature. God's nature never changes. It never changes. And he says, I, the Lord, do not change. And so because God is immutable, and immutable just simply means that he doesn't change, this means that his love never changes. This means he does not love us more at one time and less at another. And I used to think that way, that the love of God would rise and fall. When God loves us, it means really that he desires our best. And that's important to understand because when we think about loving our enemies, loving our enemies is not an emotion. I'll get to that here in a little bit. But loving our enemies is not an emotion. It is a commitment to seek God's best in the life of that person. Uh, because it's really impossible to conjure up a warm, fuzzy feeling for the person who has hurt you, hates you, and wants to hurt you again. But you can pray for them, and you can share the gospel with them if opportunity uh, permits, and you can still seek God's best in their life. You can uh, offer forgiveness even though they don't deserve it. Now, that doesn't mean that you let them back into their life, into your life. It, you know, you still can keep them at a distance if possible, but uh, love does not uh, carry the idea of emotion, not, not in that passage, not when it's talking about loving your enemies. So when God loves us, it means that he desires our best and that he is committed to our well-being and to our spiritual growth. And sometimes this means comforting us. It means comforting us. I think of 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, uh, where Paul wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction. We love that. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I have certainly been comforted by God on many, many occasions, and I welcome that. But on other times, at other times, his love can manifest itself in the form of discipline. 
you see. So it's not that God's love rises and falls, it's just that it takes on an appropriate form uh, depending upon what we need, because again, he's always seeking our best interest. So Hebrews 12, 6 says, for those whom the Lord loves, and there it's using our Greek verb agapao, those whom the Lord loves, he what? He disciplines, okay? So his love is always perfect. And I have a quote here from Robert B. Thiem Jr. from his Thiem's Bible Doctrine Dictionary. He says, divine love, like every other attribute of God, is eternal, unchanging, and unfailing. Now there he cites a few passages. One is in 1 Chronicles 16.34, which says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting. Now, the word loving kindness there translates a very interesting Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word kesed. Kesed, probably pronounced more like chesed. You got to get that guttural in there, that guttural sound. But kesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, kesed, uh, C-H-E-S-E-D, that has been translated as, as loving kindness. I think the, the better understanding of that is loyal love or commitment love because it speaks of loyalty. And so here it says that his kesed, his loyal love, his commitment love is everlasting. Psalm 57, 10, uh, for your loving kindness is great. And they're using the Hebrew noun kesed again. And then in verse 136, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his loving kindness, notice, is everlasting. So going back to Theme's quote here, he says, divine love, like every other attribute of God, is eternal, unchanging, and unfailing. Even God's complete knowledge of the sins and failures of his creatures cannot disappoint, frustrate, or diminish his love. God's love can never be compromised, for it is governed by his perfect integrity. Infinitely superior to human love, divine love always functions in a rational manner, free from emotion and sentimentality, end quote. Now, God is interested, carrying on in the notes here, God is interested in saving lost sinners because he loves them and wants what is best for them. Again, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So in John three sixteen, love is seen as that beneficial act of God born out of his eternal attribute of love, whereby he seeks to save lost sinners by directing them to Christ as their Savior. God's love is based entirely on his character and not in the beauty or worth of the object. Let me say that again. God's love is based entirely on his character and not in the beauty or worth of the object. Again, Romans 5.8, Paul says that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And according to W.E. Vine, and here I'm citing from the Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words, page 382, a good little resource, by the way, to have for your library if you can get it. W.E. Vine says, quote, In respect of agapao as used of God, it expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being towards entirely unworthy objects, end quote. And Christopher A. Beetham, and here I have a quote, and this is taken from, uh, from looking at the Greek verb agapao. It's taken from a concise New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology and Exegesis, page 111. He says, quote, God is essentially love, and his purpose right from the beginning has been one of love. The love of the Father for the Son is thereby the archetype of all love. This fact, he says, is made visible in the sending and self-sacrifice of the Son. God's primary purpose, he says, God's primary purpose for the world is his compassionate and forgiving love, which, he, which asserts itself despite the world's hostile rejection of it, end quote. Despite the world's hostile rejection of it. Listen, the vast majority of humanity... Uh, will reject God, will reject his Son as Savior. They will suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That is, unfortunately, uh, the outcome of history, that the majority will not accept Christ. 
um, I think of in Matthew 7, where Jesus says, Narrow is the path that leads to life, and few are they who find it, but broad is the path that leads to, to destruction, and many are they who find it. But this doesn't stop God from loving. That's his point here. It doesn't stop God from demonstrating his love. It doesn't stop God from pouring out his love upon a lost and fallen world that he wants to save, that he desires to save, and that he has made every provision for them to be saved. But he doesn't force them to be saved. God is not a bully. He doesn't force himself upon people. He offers it. This great offer of love through the sacrifice of his son is offered to all humanity. And it is free for them to accept or to reject, Uh, but it is nonetheless available to all. And this is a display of God's love upon everybody, a display of God's love upon all humanity. Now, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 4, 9, and 10, he says, By this the love of God was manifested in us. Notice that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live, notice, through him that we might live through him, because it's only in him, in Christ, that we have life. It's only in Christ that we have forgiveness of sins. It's only in Christ that we have all the wonderful blessings that we have as believers. Here, he says again, so that we might live through him. And then he says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And how did he love us? And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And we're going to spend a a future lesson here on the subject of propitiation, because propitiation from the uh, Greek noun here, halosmos, means satisfaction. It means satisfaction. It means that what Christ accomplished on the cross satisfied the Father. He is satisfied with uh, Christ's work upon the cross. Do you want God to be satisfied with you? Believe in Christ. And at that moment, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, and you have a wonderful uh, gift of blessings that are bestowed upon you. And at that moment, uh, uh, God the Father is satisfied with us because of what Christ did for us. He is our Savior. We do not save ourselves. It is Christ and Christ alone. Now, our salvation was not earned by anything that we did, but rather by the love he showed to us by sending his son to be the satisfying sacrifice for our sins. Here I have a quote from W.E. Vine, and this is taken from Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words, page 381 and 382. He says, quote, God's love is seen in the gift of his son. But obviously, this is not the love of complacency or affection. That is, it was not drawn out by any excellency in its objects. It was an exercise of the divine will in deliberate choice made without assignable cause save that which lies in the nature of God himself, end quote. In other words, God loves because God is love, and he loves because of who he is and not because of the beauty or the worth of the object. Because we were not lovely, we are not lovely, will not be lovely, we are sinners in Adam, sinners by nature, sinners by choice. We fail in many ways, in many ways, and yet God loves us. And this is born out of who he is and not who we are or what we do for him. It is it is not based on any beauty in the object. It is not based on any works. It is based solely on the character of God, that God loves because of who he is. So again, God loves because of who he is, as it is natural for him to love. 1 John 4, 16 says, for God is love. And listen, that is a one-way truth. That is a one-way truth. God is love. But you can't reverse that. You cannot deify love. You cannot say love is God. And I recently read a sermon a few weeks ago that that's exactly what it did. It was the most horrendous, evil thing that this person did by deifying love. And he elevated love to become God. And it's a one-way truth. You can't can't reverse that order. And, And so the scripture is very clear when it says that God is love. And if love is defined, uh, and love is defined as that which uh, wills the good of its objects, then God is love. Excuse me, let me correct that. If love is defined as that which wills the good of its objects, as Geisler states, uh, then God is good, end quote. 
Okay, so having talked about the love of God as it relates to soteriology, I couldn't help myself. I could, but I didn't. Uh, I decided to give some application of love. How does this play out in the Christian life? How does our understanding the love of God, how does the love of God poured out within us, how does that manifest itself in our daily life? Because we we love, uh, John wrote in John 4, he says, we love because he first loved us. So when we understand and receive the love of God, then that changes us. It does something to us and it motivates us to want to love others. And so uh, we benefit from the God uh, from the love of God vertically, and then that plays out in our horizontal relationship with others. So talking about the Christian application of love, the application of love. So God's love can be experienced in the heart of believers and can in turn manifest itself uh, toward others in a similar way. In other words, we can love others the way God loves us. Okay. Lewis Berry Chafer here. I'm citing him from, uh, let's see, it's from his, uh, uh, his book, He That is Spiritual. And that's a really good little book. If you've never read his little book, He That is Spiritual, I recommend it very highly. He says, a human heart cannot produce divine love, but it can experience it. To have a heart that feels the compassion of God is to drink of the wine of heaven, end quote. Now, the Apostle John, 1 John, 1 John 3.16 First John, his little letter, he says, we know, uh, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, end quote. Do you see how that works? We understand his love, his commitment, his desiring our best, his giving something precious, his giving something valuable, his giving his son to come and to die in our place. And so we understand this sacrifice that, that he made. We understand this commitment uh, to uh, provide for our best. We understand this. At least we should understand this in our growing relationship. And in turn, what it does is it motivates us to take on this very love of God that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, that can be in an ultimate sense, uh, a final sense in which one is willing to die in the place of others. That, that's valid. But I think John is including it in a very broad way in the sense that we ought to lay down our lives sacrificially in an ongoing way for the brethren. In other words, for their edification, for their building up, for their advance. And I know when I'm talking with other believers, I will tell them on occasion, if we're having a discussion, I will say, I desire your success. I desire your best. What can I give? How can I help you succeed? How can I help you be the best version of you? How can I help you in your walk with the Lord? Because I'm a Bible teacher. That's, that's my gift. That's what God gave me. So I want to try to communicate those things that help them in their walk uh, with others. And so in that sense, it becomes a form of Christian service. Now, as Christians, we are called to manifest love in its ideal form, in its ideal form. And when you read 1 Corinthians, boy, they were a kind of a messed up uh, group of people. Uh, they were all believers. Every single one there was believers. Uh, Paul calls them saints in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He calls them saints. Uh, but even though they, and by the way, saint is just simply a synonym for a Christian. But even though they were saints uh, by by their relationship to God through Christ, they were not saintly in conduct. They were very carnal in conduct. So they were saints who were sinning, and they were following their sin nature rather than uh, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And so they did not display love. And so Paul, in in his letter, uh, gives them this understanding of love. Now, here in this passage, he's using the noun form. He's talking about love here uh, in the noun form, uh, which is agape. So Paul described this love saying, quote, love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, love does not brag and is not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly. In other words, it's not rude. It does not seek its own. In other words, it's not self-seeking. It seeks the best of others. It seeks the interests of others. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. In other words, it's not hypersensitive. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. In other words, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. 
it lets them go. So it does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, because it's committed, okay, it's commitment love, endures all things. Uh, love never fails. Love never fails. And so there again, he's talking about agape love. Now, Paul directs Christian husbands, he directs Christian husbands uh, to look to Christ as their role model. And I have this responsibility upon me. And this, this command, by the way, uh, God's commands, his directives can become particular based on your situation. Uh, Ephesians 5.25 did not speak to me when I was a single man. But as soon as I got married, all of a sudden, bam, this verse applies to me. It applies to me. And so he says here, husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. And there he's using the Greek verb agapao. Husbands, love your wives. In other words, be committed to them. Desire their best interest. Husbands, love your wives. And notice what, what the standard is. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Just as Christ also loved the church. So Christ is the standard. That I am asked to abide by. Okay, so I'm told to love my wife. But here's something interesting. I cannot fulfill this mandate to love my wife as Christ loves the church if I don't know who Christ is. In other words, in order for me to obey this directive, I must have a well-developed Christology. I must know who Christ is. I must understand his condescension of love, his coming down to take upon himself humanity. I must understand his love and compassion. I must understand his sacrifice. I must understand his heart towards the greater good of those for whom he came to die. I must understand other doctrines. It helps me to understand soteriology. It helps me to understand these things. But if I don't understand who Christ is, and if I don't understand his love, if I don't understand his sacrifice, if I don't understand his commitment, if I don't understand his seeking God, the Father's best in the lives of other people, if I don't understand those things, then I can't fulfill this command. And so this requires me to learn God's word in order to live his word. So again, he says here, husbands, love your wives. Again, notice just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So this means he sacrifices himself for her, always seeking her best interest, helping to lead her into God's will, because that's always the primary thing, always to lead her into God's will. And according to 1 Peter 3, 7, showing her honor, honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Showing her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Now that's to husbands. Now Christians should also be marked by love for each other. And this speaks to all Christians, which includes husbands and wives and wives to husbands. Uh, but here it says Christians should, uh, I've got in my notes, Christians should be marked by love for each other, which is predicated on the love of Christ. You see, in the Old Testament, the command was love others, um, basically as you love yourself, okay? And, but Jesus here gives a new commandment, a new commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another Notice, as I have loved you. So Christ now becomes the standard. Christ now becomes the standard. Even as I have loved you, that you also may love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so that becomes obvious to others if we begin to manifest this directive. And so this is a command that, again, he says, even as I have loved you. So this directive here even assumes, again, a Christology. How has Christ loved us? How do we understand that love? Because how we understand his love is how we are to model that in, in ourselves as we relate to other people around us. So again, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And love should be shown even to our enemies, even to our enemies. Jesus uh, said in Matthew 5, 44 and 45, he says, I say to you, love your enemies. And there is the use of the Greek verb agapao again. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Prayer becomes a manifestation of love. You see, Jesus helps us here. He says, I say to you, love your enemies. And to love your enemies means that you seek God's best in their life. 
that you are committed to seeking God's best in their life, which means praying for them. It means extending forgiveness to them, even though they don't ask for it or deserve it. And it means being willing to share the gospel with them. And again, always desiring their best. Now, is this challenging? Yes. Very challenging. Welcome to Christianity. Uh, this is part of discipleship. This is part of advancing to maturity. And, and love here is not a feeling. It can't be. It can't be. It's impossible, impossible to conjure up a warm, fuzzy feeling for the person who has hurt you, hates you, and probably wants to hurt you again. So this directive here is a directive at the mind. It is a directive at the will. And so we understand the directive and we choose to abide by it. This is the walk of faith. This is not feelings. Feelings are not involved here. In fact, feelings might actually get in the way of obeying this directive. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. He says, so that, and this is where we manifest the very love of God for us, so that you may be sons of your father. In other words, that your behavior may be characteristic of your father who is in heaven. And notice the manifestation of his love is displayed in gracious terms. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, this is how God's love displays itself in a common grace to all humanity. Now, there is a special grace, and I would even argue a special love, that comes for those who are very much uh, within a, a good, healthy relationship with you. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a common love and a common grace that is extended to everybody, even our enemies. So here, love is not an emotion, but a commitment to love others graciously as God loves us, and to manifest that love by seeking their best interests. And this can be through prayer, through sharing the gospel, through helping to meet their needs, and so on. We also see God's love shown towards Israel, uh, God's chosen people. Jeremiah 31.3, uh, God says, uh, the Lord uh, himself says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. But notice I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, God is eternal and his love is eternal, which means it never fades for his people Israel. And for us to possess the love of God is to possess that which he loves. You see, and one cannot claim to be, one cannot claim to have God's love and simultaneously hate Israel, his chosen people. There's simply no place for anti Semitism in the heart of anyone especially the Christian. Lewis Berry Chafer, and here I'm citing him from his Systematic Theology, Volume 7, page 206, uh, he says, quote, When the Christian loves with a divine compassion, he will, he will acknowledge what God loves. Therefore, he too must love Israel. Now, that's not a blanket endorsement for all that Israel says and does, because Israel has a history of evil and wickedness uh, amongst many of their leaders and people. That's certainly true. There was always uh, the righteous remnant. And that's even true today. So it's not a blanket endorsement for all that Israel says and does, but they are nonetheless the covenant people of God. They are the chosen people of God. And so we must always have love for them. We must always pray for them and to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, we also display God's love for the lost by, by sharing the gospel of grace with the hope and, and prayer that they will believe in Christ as their Savior and have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We do. I pray for my enemies. I have people who have hurt me, and I had to let go of that hurt. Uh, Proverbs 19.11 says, It is to the glory of a man to overlook an offense. And even Jesus, when he was on the cross, prayed and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And even though they were operating in evil and hatred, uh, there was an, also an ignorance there in, uh, in their actions. They were tools. They were puppets of Satan in many ways. Now, that did not exempt them from responsibility. They still had to bear the consequences of their actions. Um, but nonetheless, Jesus extended uh, forgiveness to them. 
And we see that same thing in Stephen, when Stephen is being stoned in Acts 7, when he's being stoned to death, that he falls to his knees and he mimics uh, the words of Christ when he says, do not hold this sin against them. He's, he's praying that for their forgiveness. And that is a display of faith. It is a display of faith. Okay. So we demonstrate God's love for other uh, Christians when we give of our resources to help meet their needs. Uh, this is also true. Uh, John wrote in 1 John 3, 17 and 18, Whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And so there has to be some action to that. Now, finally, we display uh, love for others, again, by praying for them, by doing good. Galatians 6.10 says, So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. To all people. That's that common good that extends to everybody. It's like a common grace or a common love that extends to everybody. And notice, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. To those who are of the household of the faith. So we display our loves by praying for them, by doing good, by encouraging them. And people need to be encouraged. They need to be built up. We live in a world that can uh, knock you down mentally, emotionally. I know I get hit regularly and I have to have my battery recharged. And when others offer a word of encouragement to me, it lifts me up. And I try to extend that to others as well. But that's a display of love. And then also helping them in their walk of faith, helping them in their walk of faith. Uh, Paul says um, uh, in Colossians 2, 5 through 7, For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, uh, the Lord, so walk in him. You received him by faith. You are to walk by faith having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So Paul is always concerned about helping others to grow up and to advance to maturity. All right, so we chase some rabbit trails here at the end, but that's all right. So here we've uh, uh, closed out this lesson on the love of God that saves Uh, because the main focus of this lesson was to look at the love of God that offers us salvation in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope that today's lesson has been helpful to you. I pray that you've benefited from it. Uh, I thank you very much, and I wish you a blessed day.